My name is Justin, and I'm an addict. And thanks to my God, the steps, and the fellowship of other addicts, I am sober since June 19th of 2015. And for that, I am beyond grateful. Welcome to the RICO 12 Speaker Meeting. We are an organization whose addictions include alcohol, drugs, lust, and sex, food, and gambling, just to name a few. We come together from all places, faiths, and backgrounds to learn the similarities of addiction and to gain tools and hope from others who are walking a similar path. We invite recovering addicts with at least one year sobriety and who are actively working their recovery in their respective fellowships to share as guest speakers their experience, strength, and hope on a live Zoom meeting each Friday at noon central time for 20 to 25 minutes. Then we, the live audience, get the opportunity to ask questions of the speaker for, a number, for another 20 to 25 minutes. In order to ask questions, please type them in the Q&A link at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you are hearing this podcast recorded and would like to participate as a live audience member in the future, or if you would like to be a guest speaker in a future meeting, please go to www.reco12.com. That's R-E-C-O-1-2 dot com to learn more and submit your email address there to receive weekly invitations and to submit to become a guest speaker. RICO 12 is an ad-free service, and we appreciate your help in keeping it that way. We gratefully accept contributions to help cover the costs of the Zoom plat- platform, podcast platform, web hosting, and, and administrative costs. The guest speaker also chooses a fellowship or recovery-centered organization to which the majority of contributions from that week's meetings will be donated to. Contr- to contribute, you can go to rico.rico12.com forward slash support, or you can click the link to PayPal in the chat of the live meeting, or if you use Venmo, you can also contribute there. Our handle there is at rico-12 spelled out. When you contribute, please specify the, the meeting number, and this is meeting number one. Now, let's introduce our guest speaker for today, Harvey E. Harvey E. is a 65-year-old Orthodox Jewish dentist from Toronto, soon to celebrate 42 years of marriage to his wife, Sharon, proud papa to 18 grandchildren, soon to be 19, and sober since January 7, 2014. He came into the Sexaholics Anonymous rooms at a very low bottom, acting out with escorts sometimes multiple times per day. Today, even with almost six and a half years of sobriety and recovery, Harvey works a very solid program, including daily sobriety renewals, prayer, meditation, daily maintenance steps of 10 through 12, and other things. Harvey has spoken at international essay conventions, and shares and his shares are available on podcasts such as the Journey Through Life podcast and the Daily Reprieve. He has been a very active member of the SA phone meeting community for years, moderating calls throughout the week, and spearheading the use of WhatsApp groups to extend the fellowship of these meetings 24-7. Over the last year, he has become an active participant in SAL Zoom meetings, and Harvey has chosen to have contributions from this speaker meeting go to SAL. Details of that can be found at sal12step.org. We will learn more about that organization in a bit later. Since I met Harvey a little over six months ago, he has quickly become one of my best friends in recovery and has changed the way I look at my relationship with God and it, the way I look at recovery. I love this man, and I think you will learn to love him too. Take it away, Harvey. This, the, the stage is yours. All right. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right. I'm Harvey. I am a grateful recovering sexaholic, a good person worthy of recovery, and uh, never grateful enough to be sober since January 7th of 2014. And before I get into my speech, I just want to share one little thing here. So this is a special for my friend, Justin. Today is a special day for you and for the universe. Today you started your life's journey, and the universe got a precious gift, and that is you. I'm wishing you a day of joy to fill your life with pleasant surprises. And that was just, uh, I just wanted to share that because that was for you. Thank you. Harvey. All right. Okay. And um, yeah. So let me just close that. All right. Okay. So I am, uh, I wanted to share about my journey and, and specifically about the joys and the, and, and the miracles that I have, uh, have experienced in this program. So I, I figured I'd start with a little of what it used to be like, because if you don't know what it was like, you won't really appreciate why this is a gift. Uh, and I think it's only a gift because I appreciate what it used to be like. So, um, 
I, uh, as, as uh, Justin said, I am 65 today. So I was 59 when I got into this room, into the rooms of SA, uh, and I came in as a very low bottom. Um, my life was uh, a shambles. I was, uh, it was just a, uh, just a hurricane. I was a hurricane. Uh, I was acting out with uh, with uh, escorts twice a day, three times a day, sometimes multiple escorts. Uh, I was spending a huge amount of money and a huge amount of time escaping from the world that had, uh, frankly, had never been safe for me since I was five or six years old. And I recently saw a message. Somebody said that, uh, um, you know, you don't ask why addiction, you ask why pain. Uh, and I thought that was really, really profound. Uh, because I lived in pain. Um, and uh, my wife, for instance, you know, when I told her I'm living in pain and I have been living in pain all these years, she was stunned you know, because she, she'd never noticed. She knew there was something off, but she didn't see me as somebody who was writhing or you know, writhing in pain all the time because it was emotional pain and it was, I was hiding it really, really well. Um, I was distant. I was... Uh, I was unable to to be intimate with her or anybody else. Um, I uh, I didn't know how I didn't love myself. I had extremely low self esteem, and again, that was something my wife was stunned when I told her. You know, uh, I just feel like I'm you know swimming around in the toilet all the time. You know, and, and it's just it's warm, but it's really smelly. And uh, you know, she looked at me and she goes, "What are you talking about? You know, you." You've got a successful practice and you have a success, you know, beautiful family and grandchildren and, and, and enough money and you have cars and you have, you have all these things that, that should be telling you, you know, to be telling everybody that you're so successful and you're so happy, you know, and I certainly wasn't any of those things. But I looked the part and I, uh, I was a tremendously gifted liar. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's one of the, uh, one of the gifts of addiction, <laughs> one of the things actually that I've lost. Um, you know, if you want to talk about the gifts of addiction, uh, of, of recovery, I, I think one of the gifts is reco of recovery is, is, is forgetting how to lie and, and not being the terrific liar that I used to be. I, I frankly can't get away with anything anymore. And it's, uh, it's hard sometimes to live like that, but I really don't want to go back to the old way. Um, yeah. So, um, when I got into the program, I, um, you know, I had this, uh, excuse me, this addictive personality issue. Um, and, uh, I, um, you know, I had a tremendous amount of shame. I lived in shame. I, I lived in toxic shame. Uh, I had this strong sense that I was supposed to be perfect. Perfectionism was a huge, huge part of my life. Um, and I was hungry for power and control. I had to control everything because I had to make sure that everything was safe or tried to make it as safe as I could. And, and that led me to be, as, as I said, very dishonest, uh, denying who I was. Um, I also thought in black and white, that's a concept. You know, I'm, uh, there's no gray in my world. There was no gray. It was either black or white. I lived in extremes. Um, I was self-obsessed. Uh, everything was about me. Uh, anything that happened had to be about me, you know, and, um, and I was selfless, but selfless in a different way, not selfless in that I, that I cared about others, but selfless, meaning I really didn't care about myself. Um, I didn't know anything about self-care. I didn't appreciate that, um, that I could and should be doing things for myself that, uh, that worked for me and it made me feel valuable to myself. Um, and I, I had this strong sense of inner emptiness. Um, and I lived with uh, a very purposeless life. Uh, I lived without meaning, without purpose. Um, Abraham Maslow speaks about, you know, this uh, meaning in life and self-actualization in his work. And, uh, and that was, uh, that was uh, definitely, uh, you know, the pyramid he talks about. You can look it up. Um, and I had no meaning. I had no purpose in my life. Uh, I was incredibly, uh, incredibly involved in people pleasing because I didn't have any value. I didn't see any value. So I was obsessed with trying to, uh, to, uh, to get approval from others and to get sort of that power. And I call myself a vampire. I was always sucking power from others by trying to get their approval. Um, 
And I was full of guilt, of course, because of my behaviors, although that actually got less as I got further along because at a certain point, I was so sure that my relationship to God was so bad uh, that he had long ago given up on me. And in fact, uh, as I like to put it, uh, I kind of felt like I was the warden in my own self-imposed prison. And I was here to punish myself and because he couldn't be bothered anymore. Um, I had a lot of trouble managing anger, uh, not surprisingly. Um, I did some work around that actually along the way. Um, uh, I don't think I'm a rageaholic, but I certainly had some issues with anger. Um, and I'm sure I had this underlying low level of depression that kind of it would go up and down a little bit every so often, but uh, certainly uh, a certain level of depression and living that way. And uh, the other thing I noticed I, or that I now know that I had was uh, something I call emotional numbness. Uh, and that was that I, I really didn't, I was afraid of, of emoting, afraid, afraid of having emotions, of feeling emotions. God gave us emotions. I have, uh, you know, anger, fear, sadness, and joy. Those are my anger. Those are my emotions. Uh, and I was afraid of all of them. Even joy was something I was afraid of. Um, so I did my best not to feel, uh, and uh, so that was part of the reason why I found addiction, because addiction gave me something that would numb me from having to have emotions. Um, any emotions that I started to feel that I was going to have, uh, I would just stuff down in my pants, uh, because that was where my addiction uh, rested most of the time. Uh, so that's where I hit it, and of course it popped up later uh, in, in any number of ways. Um, yeah, I had, uh, what else? I got a list here. I was really, really good at blaming others. Uh, it was always about other people. Everything was about other people. I, I blamed my my mother. I blamed my father, who uh, tragically took his life when I was 12. Uh, oh, I blamed him for a lot. I blamed uh, my wife for a lot. Uh, you know, if I didn't have a wife, I could, I wouldn't have so much guilt. That's for sure. Um, I also was a certain, in a certain way, Peter Pan. Uh, that was another part of my life. Uh, I never wanted to grow up. I never wanted to take responsibility. Uh, if I could have lived in Never Never Land, that's where I thought I was living. Uh, and it just meant that I didn't have to take responsibility for anything. And I, like I said, I never wanted to grow up. One of the most important things that today I know and I didn't have then was um, no, no concept of boundaries. Uh, I could not set boundaries. I could not live with boundaries. Uh, I didn't know what a boundary was. Um, the other thing I had was an, a need for immediate gratification. Uh, I wanted what I wanted when I wanted it. I was a spoiled brat. I'm sure if the big book would have been written sometime in the 50s or 60s, uh, they wouldn't have talk, uh, talked about selfishness, self-centeredness. They just would have had a picture of Harvey with a sign that said, spoiled brat, uh, which is, I think, the addict, uh, the, the quintessential look of the addict. I was a spoiled brat. Um, I, had a, I had no friends. Uh, I had maybe a few, but they weren't real friends. Um, I was afraid of, of opening up and being intimate with anyone, including friends. So... Um, nobody knew the real Harvey. Um, I had what I like to use the term uh, holograms of Harvey, and I had several of them. I had the hologram Harvey that was uh, Harvey the husband. I had Harvey the, the, the parent. I had Harvey the son. I had Harvey the brother. I had Harvey the member of my synagogue. I had Harvey the dentist. Uh, and, Har and I had Harvey the friend, and every one of them was a different Harvey. Um, and uh, I had to... I had to juggle all these different holograms in the air all the time uh, in order not to be found out for all the lies that I was telling. So I lived a very, very tiring life. I was constantly exhausted at 59. I must have felt like I'm, I, now I understand, I must have felt I was probably in, in my 80s in terms of the energy level that I had because it was, uh, I was just, just spending so much energy just being that person and all of those people that I, and of course, no one got to see the real Harvey, which I hope I am uh, trying to be today. Um, so, so that's where I was. And I hope I didn't spend too much time on that, but uh, 
in order to understand the gifts, I think uh, I, need, I wanted to share what used to be. So today, as a result of the program, first of all, when I got into the program, the first thing I noticed was fellowship. Um, and fellowship was so, so important to me. The anonymity that I found in those rooms where I could come uh, day one. Uh, and my, my therapist asked me and he pleaded with me to be as open and as, as uh, vulnerable as I could be at meetings from day one. And I shared my uh, same-sex attraction from day one uh, because it was important. Uh, I didn't want to live in shame anymore. Uh, and I was immediately accepted by everybody in the room. I felt uh, like I was uh, supported uh, and I had friends. And it was really, really different for me because uh, the rooms were only men in those days. Uh, there are very few women even now that come to Toronto meetings. Uh, so I was sitting in a room with men. Uh, and of course, men used to be objects of my fantasy and my, and my lust. Uh, and to come to meetings and quickly realize that I could have relationships with men that weren't related to either wanting to have sex or not wanting to have sex with those people. Uh, and that was extremely uh, new for me. Uh, took me a few weeks before I got comfortable enough to, uh, to share much. Uh, I sat with my hat and my coat on thinking I could uh, pretend that I wasn't an Orthodox Jew. Nobody will know. Uh, and then I uh, finally, somebody came and I, I actually came out of my coat <laughs> and out of my hat. Um, and that man became my very, very close friend and till today. Uh, and he taught me um, one of the greatest gifts of recovery, which is uh, understanding how grateful I needed to be and, and learning to use a tool of a gratitude list, which I used extensively through the first uh, nine months until I started working steps. I was doing gratitude lists all the time and reminding myself every day all of the wonderful things that I should be grateful for. And the greatest gift uh, that you get from that, I believe, is uh, the beginning of understanding that, you, that, that I was worthy, that I was worthy of all these things that I had. And I, my list was long. I had lots to be grateful for. And it became clear to me that I could not be uh, the piece of garbage that I thought I was, uh, having uh, all of these uh, gifts being bestowed on me on a regular daily basis. So that was the beginning of learning that, you know, to start working on my self-esteem. And at the same time, my therapist was also doing that. And I had self-affirmations that I used to carry around in my pocket, which I, I don't do anymore, but I still say them to myself. Uh, and, I, and I actually introduced myself as, a, as Harvey Ehrlich, you know, as Harvey, a grateful recovering sexaholic, good person, worthy of recovery. And that is my affirmation. Uh, and I need to affirm myself uh, because uh, as I've learned, um, I need to, sh to crush that ego that I was living with. And I had this huge ego control freak, uh, megalomaniac kind of person who had to control and manipulate everything. Um, and I had created that because I had such low self-esteem and in trying to build my self-esteem up was necessary so that I didn't need my ego. So um, I spent a lot of time on self-esteem and I still do. Uh, I think the... Uh, it's another one of the greatest gifts I've gotten is that I have learned to shut down the inner critic uh, that amazingly enough had my mother's voice most of the time. I guess you could figure, probably figure out why. And I, uh, I don't need that inner critic anymore. Uh, I have a responsible voice that makes me uh, responsible for making good decisions. And I also have the, uh, you know, the inspired dreamer uh, in there too. Uh, but I, I got rid of the critic because the critic wasn't doing any good for me. Uh, so I've given up that critic and uh, it's, uh, it's worked out really well. Um, I don't have to listen to him anymore. Um, and even, sh even turning him down, even a notch, you know, from 10 or 15,000 thoughts a day to, you know, to 5,000 thoughts a day actually helped a lot. Um, the other thing I learned in, in, the, in meetings was uh, honesty because of the safety of the rooms, I learned that I could be honest for, for the first time in my life. Uh, and it was difficult. Uh, it was a muscle that I had not used uh, ever. Uh, and learning to be honest uh, in a room uh, has allowed me to learn to be honest uh, with all of the relationships that I have. And of course, the number one relationship in my life is my wife. And uh, we are practicing, um, I don't know if I like the word rigorous, um, you know, certainly not, uh, not, not, 
not mean and nasty honesty. Uh, rigorous honesty is important. And, um, you know, and I, I, I've also learned that, uh, that it's safe, that it's safe to do that. And, uh, and safety does, does come, uh, you know, to, to people who work the program. I think, uh, I think that's another gift. Um, I've learned that I, that I am safe. Um, and that was, that came about when I got to step two and created a God of my understanding that worked for me. Uh, and the one that hadn't worked out for me, uh, was a dysfunctional relationship with something. I don't even know if it was really God, uh, judgmental, punishing, angry, disappointed God, uh, kind of a lot like my mother. Um, uh, and I replaced that God with uh, a loving, uh, unconditionally loving God one that I could trust that really has my back, who really wants the best for me and everything in my world I can see in that way today. Uh, and that was a huge, huge difference uh, in getting to the step where I started to believe that he loves me. Um, that opened up uh, the possibility for me to love myself. Uh, along with those self-affirmations that I was doing, um, and the support of the group and the support of the fellowship, I learned that I was worthy and that I was valuable and I was enough and I am enough. Uh, and knowing that I am enough um, is, is tremendous because now I do feel safe and I do feel that with that God and that understanding of who that is and the relationship I now have with him uh, comes trust. And trust was something, as I said, we, I didn't trust anybody and today uh, I trust most people. Uh, of course, I'm not an idiot. Sometimes there are people you can't trust, um, but I but I do trust a lot more people, um, and that makes life a lot easier to live because I'm not anxious and I'm not going crazy all the time, worrying. And I've learned to live one day at a time, as the program teaches us so clearly. I need to to I needed to find a way to. Uh, to appreciate that I, I don't have to worry about the future because the future hasn't happened yet. There's nothing I can do about the future. Uh, the serenity prayer tells me that I can't change the things I can't change. I have to change the things I can, which is me. Uh, and I'm working on that every day. Um, but I can't change the future. I can't change the past. If I live in the past, I'm living with, uh, with the pain and the sadness and the depression and the guilt. I don't want to live there either. Um, I believe the uh, the proper way to look at the past is kind of like we drive. You know, most of the time I spend my uh, time looking out the front window, my dashboard, to see who's uh, coming, you know, where what's going on in front of me. Uh, every so often I glance at the rear view mirror just so that I know where I've been and uh, if there's any lessons that I needed to learn in that. And that's how I understand the past today. And like I said, the future is hasn't happened yet, so I don't need to worry about it. Uh, all I know is that uh, the God is taking care of me and whatever I could possibly have wanted, I've learned long ago to stop praying for things that I think I want because uh, uh, as many of the people who know me will, will, will know that I say that, you know, when I pray to God, there are always going to be three answers and uh, the, it's either going to be yes, not now, or Harvey, I've got something a lot better for you. And the question, the more I understand that that third answer is the right answer, is the most right answer, is the more I see I don't pray the same way I used to when I thought God was supposed to be my concierge. Um, I don't pray for things to happen. I pray for God to do, to, to help me understand that everything that's happening in my world is for my best. Um, and as long as I keep, uh, keep that in front of me, I, um, I'm in a good place. I've learned to put up boundaries, uh, and I think that's a real gift of the program. Um, for some of us, uh, CODA work has been, uh, codependency stuff has been, uh, been important, and I did some of that along the way. Uh, I needed to appreciate that, uh, that in order not to be angry all the time, I needed to have healthy and strong boundaries uh, around people who take advantage of me, people who don't appreciate boundaries. And I live with a lot of people like that. Uh, I think we all do. I think there are lots of people who haven't learned proper boundaries and having learned to appreciate that I need boundaries uh, has allowed me to appreciate that I have a right to self-care. I have a right to get to meetings. I have a right to eat properly, to take care of my body, to take care of my, uh, my life in whatever way it becomes necessary. Uh, and self-care is, is another very, very important way that I prove every day and remind myself every day that I'm worthy 
and that I'm worth the work that I'm doing. And, uh, and that's a great gift. That's a tremendous gift again. Um, you know, I acknowledge my own needs. Um, that's, that's, I can't tell you how important that's been. Um, what else I have? I've also learned how important it is to, uh, to have relationships and to appreciate what that's what's supposed to be about and intimacy and uh, learning that I can be intimate with my wife and with others. Um, not sexual in any other way, with except from with, with my wife, but um, uh, I can have authentic intimacy and love, and I love uh, many many people in my world today that I've learned to love, and I can uh, do that in a safe way, and appreciate that uh, you know that I can uh, feel secure. Um, I, I get a feeling of full a full fullness of my life. It's a, it's a fullness and knowing that there's. That I, that I have love and that I can share love. Um, loving myself has allowed me to do that, as the Bible would say, has told us, uh, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. And obviously loving yourself is, is, uh, is important and has to come first. Um, and that's come from, as I said before, a relationship with God and a relationship with myself and the self-affirmations that I've learned to, uh, to take on and, and getting rid of the critic, the, self, the inner critic that I live with. Um, so, um, so I am grateful. I am grateful for, uh, for sponsorship, uh, for being a sponsor, for having finished the 12 steps and learning how important it is to share my, my work with others and what I believe with others and this program with others and, uh, to be available for others has really, uh, it's added so many other gifts. And I want to quickly say that being a sponsor is, is the most amazing way to practice how to be a man, how to be a human being in this world. Uh, before you go out there and have relationships with your friends, you know, you can do this with people who are, who are there for you, who care, who want to, to listen, want to hear what you have to say, and are truly, uh, you know, want recovery. Um, that's a, it's a lab, it's a lab, it's a laboratory, an opportunity for me to practice the steps, practice the principles that I've learned and humility and, 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 and honesty and all the others, uh, so that I've, I can do that out there in the real world. Um, it's offered me tremendous opportunities for, to see God's hand, uh, in, in other people's lives, the way I see him in mine today. Uh, and it, if I ever wonder if God exists, I certainly all I have to do is just remind myself of the, of the of, of the shine of, of the of the, the brilliance of having people see God uh, and find God in this program, uh, because the answer to the addiction is, of course, the power of God, uh, and I know that today. Um, sharing it with others is so important to me because it keeps me uh, keeps me vital, keeps me fresh. I don't get stale in my program, and that's another gift. It's changed my life because I needed to change my life. I become uh, much more disciplined. I wake up in the morning earlier, and I pray, and I meditate. I do a lot of meditation. That's another gift that I want to share. Uh, meditating three times a day has really changed my life. I've learned uh, three-way prayer, which is another uh, wonderful tool. Uh, and I've learned to just talk to God and then shut the heck up and listen. Uh, and I'm learning to listen to everybody in my life. And I'm learning to listen and not be thinking about the answer to, that I want to give when somebody shares something. I just listen. And that was something I never did. I used to be thinking, what am I going to say when this guy stops talking or when my wife stops talking? And I had the, the solution. I was working, worrying about, about what I was going to answer before. Wow, well, instead of really listening and really, really focusing. And I learned how to focus. And I think I used to be an ADD child. I don't think I am anymore. Uh, maybe that was a uh, part of my addiction. Anyway, I am very, very grateful. I'm grateful for having been offered this opportunity to be the speaker today. And uh, with that, I guess I'm going to pass. Awesome, Harvey. Thank you so much, Harvey. I loved many. I loved all those uh, miracles of and gifts of recovery that you shared there. One of the ones that stuck out to me was uh, your plug of sponsorship. For me, that's been one of, one of the greatest gifts in my own recovery, and I'm grateful that you plug that too. It just helps me along. And I, and I think it's really valuable for everybody to hear. Now, before we get to read the questions that have come in and ones that I've written up as you've gone along too, 
Um, I'd like to invite you, Harvey, to share for about 60 seconds or less on SAL and why you chose that organization as the one you wanted contributions from this meeting to go to. Okay, you didn't warn me about this. <laughs> okay, I'm Harvey. I, I'm still a grateful recovering sexaholic, and I am grateful. Uh, today is actually my year anniversary of joining SAL meetings. Um, they uh, they've changed my 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 recovery uh, fellowship in a in a, tr in a profound way. Um, uh, I love the rooms. Uh, I love uh, I love the spirit. Um, I love the spirit in a room where. I have to, I'm going to apologize because I'm going to be a little bit, uh, maybe a little rude. Uh, but in the SA rooms that I attended, uh, especially the face-to-face -face ones in Toronto, I just found that they apologized a lot for God. And uh, and I didn't really want to be that person. I, I, I think that, you know, when I found recovery and I found my sponsor, my sponsor unabashedly says that the, you know, the solution is God. Uh, so to come to a room where you almost couldn't hear the word God, or if you did, it was, you know, as you understood him, <laughs> you know, and nobody wanted to, your higher power, and nobody really wanted to say the words. And I came to SAL, and I found a room full of people who are really devoted and, 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 and connected and want to be connected to, to their Father in Heaven, to Heavenly Father, and it doesn't really matter what we call him. Um, there's a real, there's, it's not apologizing, you know, they, they have a prayer at the beginning, they have a prayer at the end, they have wonderful opportunities for sharing about, you know, about the, uh, the topic and the text that we might have been reading, and, uh, and there are people all over, um, mostly America, that come to those meetings, and they just, they just create this beautiful space, and, and I'm really, really grateful for it, and, uh, and I think it's a, it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful tool it's a wonderful organization and it deserves the support of, uh, of everybody i think awesome thank you harvey um so if any of you out there in the audience are feeling a nudging to make a small contribution please do throw do so through the links here in the chat or at rico12.com forward slash support um it's not time for harvey to answer any questions that may that we may have. If you, as a listening audience, have any that come up, please type them in the Q&A thing. Um, I, I will get to some of the questions that I wrote up as well as those that come in. And we'll close up this Q&A session uh, eight minutes before the hour. So, Harvey, I've got a question for you. You mentioned um, setting up boundaries being one of the gifts of recovery. How do you today set up healthy boundaries? How do, what does that process look like to you? Okay, good question. Thank you. Um, so my wife is the is the most important relationship that I have. So I, I guess I'll use her as my example. Um, you know, we have. If I start to feel that something happened in our relationship, uh, there was a conversation that didn't go well. That um, that uh, you know, and I start to feel restless or irritable, mostly irritable. I try not to get to anger, but I sometimes I get to angry, and I feel angry. So anger tells me that somebody has uh, violated uh, my space emotionally or physically. Um, and that usually means that I need a boundary uh, and I should have, there should have been a boundary. And if there was one, it's been violated. So I will sit down with my wife and I'll say, Sharon, um, you know, I didn't appreciate you uh, doing X or Y. Um, it made me feel that uh, whatever I got angry because I felt that it, it violated a boundary that I really was, I'd like you to respect. Uh, you know, uh, please don't have conversations, for instance, with my children about something. I would like to have been uh, offered the opportunity to make a decision about that. And you, you broke a boundary. Um, and please, uh, I would hope that you'll respect that in the future. And uh, thank you for listening. Uh, and, and that's just one example. But, you know, that's, that's how I set up boundaries. And sometimes um, I get you know, people who don't like those boundaries and they say, no, I don't want a boundary, uh, at which point I have to make a second decision on whether I want to live with the fact that this person won't live with my boundary or whether I have to reduce the relationship to uh, something much less common and less often because uh, they won't live with my boundaries. And that's the choice that I have to make. And I make that sometimes. Thank you, Harvey. I appreciate that. Hey, Amy B. from our listening audience came in with a question. Harvey. I'd love to hear you talk about making amends. What was the process like for you? 
Okay, thank you. Good question. Um, so making amends, I had a, a, quite a list of amends to make when I, uh, when I got to a recovery. My sponsor feels very strongly about uh, not asking for forgiveness. So my, my amends was not about asking anyone to forgive me. Um, it was about cleaning my side of the street. So um, if I owed somebody an amends, uh, financial or otherwise or emotional, whatever it might have been, I, uh, I wrote it up ahead of time. And I shared it with my sponsor and he corrected uh, anything I might have tried, you know, sneak in a little forgiveness or sneak in a little bit of, uh, you know, what I want out of this. And, uh, you know, he made sure that it was purely about what I had done, um, that I uh, was wrong to have done whatever it was I did, uh, that I knew I had hurt that person, that I wanted to accept ownership of that. Um, and that I hope that I would never, ever uh, repeat that behavior, whatever it was, I would repeat those, those behaviors. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and then I always asked, uh, is there anything that I've left out? Was there anything that I did that you would like to share that maybe I have forgotten or maybe I didn't uh, bring to the fore that also happened? Uh, so those were the, the, the real direct amends that I made. Uh, of course, there was a lot of, of um, amends that I made were, that were part of my, um, you know, change in my behavior. Um, you know, I made a lot of those along the way. Um, you know, I don't try very hard not to bring my phone to the table at dinner, <laughs> for instance. There's a, that's a, you know, that's a living amends. You know, when I come in the house, I, I'm not on the phone. Uh, when I come in the house, it's, I have prayed before I come in the house and I want to be the best husband. Uh, and father, if my children are here, uh, that I can be, and I want to attend and focus and be there for the people in my life that are important to me and, and, and show them that I appreciate how important they are to me. And that's another amends that I needed to learn how to do. Um, so I make a point of, of, uh, of you know, sharing with my children, uh, texting them, WhatsApping them, letting them know how proud I am of them, stuff I, I just never did. Or if I did it, I did it very uh, haphazardly, very without without any consistency. Um, so the living amends is really important. I don't make decisions without speaking to my wife. And confrontation was huge. I hated them. Uh, I lived in a house when I grew up. There was a lot of yelling and screaming and angry and angry stuff and fights. And so I grew up thinking I'd never want confrontation. So that of course meant that I made decisions without discussion, without consultation with my wife often. Uh, because it was always easier to deal with the, uh, you know, with having to be forgiven or ask forgiveness for making the decision and doing something without her permission rather than, because then at least I got my permit, I got it done, right? I got to do what I wanted to do. So uh, I, I, that's another living amends that I've made uh, very much part of my life. And uh, I forgive myself in a lot of ways, which is the living amends that I take uh, my self-care quite, quite seriously and, and with, uh, with focus. All right. That's awesome. Thank you, Harvey. And, and maybe later I'll, I'll ask you about that self-care. But uh, right now we have another question that came in from an anonymous attendee. It says, Harvey, thank you for sharing your story. What would you say to someone who is honestly putting effort into recovery? For example, working with a sponsor, working the steps, attending meetings, and so on, but who can't seem to put together more than one or two months of sobriety? Okay. That's a that's another topic. You could call me back for that one if you want, Justin. Um, my sponsor says that uh, that relapses um, are going to always be either a step one or a step two problem. Uh, if step one or step two isn't solid, uh, you haven't built the arch that the big book talks about. The foundation stone and the cornerstone are holding together the arch, which is the keystone, which is step three. And uh, if, you're, if there's a relapse going on on a regular basis, uh, it's either going to be uh, taking back your self-will, um, becoming the spoiled brat again, uh, you know, deciding that you are the most important the, 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 the person in the world, uh, probably becoming dishonest, uh, wanting to keep a few little bottles, as they would say in the alcoholic world. Uh, I just want to keep a little bit, and sometimes that's uh, lust for your own wife, um, or just a fantasy a little bit. You know, a little fantasy won't hurt anybody. You know, and 
And even if I do fantasize with my wife or, 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 or lust after my wife, I'm married to her, I should be allowed to do that. All these, you know, these, these uh, you know, we make excuses and we make decisions, uh, you know, that work for us because we don't want to give it up. We're really not ready, really ready. Um, and step two problems are about my relationship to God. Do I really have a God that loves me unconditionally? Do I really feel that? Do I really, have I really become convinced of that? Is it really part of my life? It's not just knowledge. It's really understanding and appreciation of, of that relationship. Um, Cause without it, uh, you know, I, I'm liable to make lots of other people and myself a higher power, uh, which doesn't work. doesn't work for me. And uh, then I, I can't, I can't surrender. I, I can't surrender to, to a God or to myself for sure, but I can't surrender to a God that I don't trust absolutely uh, that he has my back, that he is my support, that he is my fan. Uh, he has to be my coach and my fan. And that, and that's really important to me. Well, I hope that answered it. I think that's great. And it leads into a follow-up question I had for you. Um, so many people, myself included, have had this image of who God is in our lives. Um, and, and as you mentioned earlier, it's many times that perception is tainted by relationships we've had with our mother, our father, a teacher, whatever it may be, where we, we felt powerless and we put those uh, attributes, whether we know it or not, on the God of our understanding. So how, how does one move out of those um, toxic be beliefs of God and into a God that can actually help, that I can actually trust to, to surrender to? Yeah, so I first of all I had to get over the uh, the blasphemy side of things because as soon as you start thinking about replacing God, you know, it sounds it sounds blasphemous, uh, and I'm not I'm not a blasphemer uh, or a blasphemer, whatever however you pronounce that. Um, so I, I I had to just suggest that whatever that was was dysfunctional, hadn't worked for me. Um, I know today I I see enough scripture that says that God can be angry and God does punish, um, but. The relationship that I want to have, the personal relationship that I want to have with God is neither of those things. Uh, for me, that God has to be uh, a loving God. And, 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 I, and those who've heard me before, I, I, I actually create an advert and I hire God. Uh, I hired a new God. Uh, I hired the God that I needed. Uh, and he was 24-7. He was omnipotent and omniscient the way, you know, all of the, most of the, of the gods of, uh, of the Judeo-Christian world uh, are. Um, but he was, uh, you know, the old God was definitely not omnipresent for me. Uh, and this one is, he's omnipresent 24 seven. He never blinks, um, you know, and he doesn't ask for pay uh, and he just wants what's best for me. He doesn't, judge me he's not disappointed in me so much you know he doesn't have expectations i think he delights when i'm good but he's okay and he still loves me even when i'm acting out and that was really hard for me to believe you know could 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 my god really really love me while i was doing all the crazy garbage that i was doing all my life and today i know that's true he loves me he loved me then he loves me now uh, you know, when I, whenever I start to get lit to, I have to say, uh, you know, patience is one of my character defects that I'm still working on. Uh, and many times a day when I start to lose my patience, I remind myself how for most of the first 59 years of my, my life, God was incredibly eternally patient with me. Um, so uh, if he can be patient with me, I certainly have to learn to be patient with others. And uh, so, I, yeah, so that's what I'm doing. So I'm learning, uh, trying to be, uh, trying to be godly, uh, you know, uh, there are lots of nice uh, hymns around that. Uh, I, uh, I want to be that person. Uh, and every day I wake up and the work I have to do today is to have the best day possible and to try to be the best Harvey I can be. Awesome. We got two more questions that came in. We'll get these two and then we'll wrap it up here. Uh, if there are any, other, any more questions, we'll address that after this. So the first one, also from an anonymous attendee, I recently learned about recovery, recovery fatigue. Given that you have been sober for so many years, have you ever experienced recovery fatigue? How did you work through that? So, um, I, I appreciate the problem. I thankfully got 
lots of education about um, recovery fatigue from my sponsor when I first got into the program. You know, he he told me very straightforwardly. He says, "You know, you're a low bottom. Uh, you're you're a mess. You know, you you better uh, you you can't take a chance. You know, you won't be able to take a chance. Uh, you need to work this program for the rest of your life, uh, like your life depends on it, because it does." And I don't want to be a dead man walking ever again, which is what I really was. Uh, I was a dead man walking. Um, so, um, you know, I, I look at my, my, my recovery work kind of like the, uh, the diabetic looks, should be looking at his insulin that he needs to take. If he's an insulin dependent diabetic, he knows he needs to wear a monitor on his, you know, and around his belly, and he has to check out the food that he's going to eat and decide how much insulin he wants to have based on the amount of sugar he's going to ingest. And, and I got to do that. And that's what I do every day. My, I live my day-to-day life uh, with prayer, with meditation, with, uh, with you know, proper diet too, uh, some exercise, getting out into the air, breathing, um, all of those things, talking to God. I talk to God all day. Uh, and I need to do that. And uh, so I, 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 I really haven't expressed, I haven't really experienced any fatigue. Um, there's so much joy here. Uh, it's hard to believe that anybody would want to give this up or, or, you know, get complacent. Although everybody, you know, it says in the big book, you know, on page uh, 85, you know, we can, uh, we can rest on our laurels. Um, I can't afford to rest on my laurels. So, uh, you know, every day I do a DSR and I remind myself I, I don't have laurels. <laughs> I can't rest on those laurels. So I pass. Awesome. I, I'm learning that I don't have laurels either. It's not, not a good thing to, to try and find laurels that I don't have. Um, I'm just going to ask one of the two remaining questions. Um, and then the other one we'll, we'll talk to in a second. Harvey, this is from Ammon C. Harvey, the blessings of recovery you enjoy are blessings I want to enjoy. But I wonder... Can I have the same blessings of recovery? Can I really recover even though my rock bottom is way different than yours? Right. So, um, yeah, especially the SAL rooms, uh, I find it's very, uh, it's very common that uh, most of the guys that are there are relatively high bottoms. Uh, they've, uh, they've succumbed to pornography, many of them, and, uh, and masturbation, but they haven't you know, ventured, God forbid, out of their marriages. They haven't, uh, they haven't got into affairs. They haven't gone, you know, whatever. And I don't need to share all the examples. Uh, everybody knows what those are. Um, so, you know, and, and we wonder, you know, do, do these people have a chance? Can they get recovery um, from, you know, if they're such high bottoms, why, why will they, why will they want to give it up? You know, Things aren't so terrible. Consequences aren't so terrible. I haven't done such awful things, especially walk into a room and I find out whatever other everybody else has been doing. And oh my gosh, those guys are really, really sick. You know, I'm not that sick. Uh, but the truth is, um, you know, the unmanageability uh, may be different. The external unmanageability may be different. You may not be married. You may not have lost your wife. You may not have lost your children. You may not have lost your jobs. You may have lost, mess, messed up your education. You may not have lost your professional licenses to practice. Uh, you may not have gone to jail, uh, but you're living in a jail. Um, and I think the success of, of a, a person's program is really getting the step one that they need. Uh, my sponsor says the only step you got to get 100% right is step one. And step one is that inner unmanageability, the stuff we discussed here at the beginning of my, my talk, about all the things I, was, I lost. I had lost so much time and so much self-confidence and self-esteem and self-respect and all of those things. I, I don't think it matters whether you're just, just if you're doing you know, pornography and masturbation or much worse things, um, if you feel what I felt, I think we sit in the same rooms and we belong together and we can appreciate uh, how, how crazy our lives are and how I don't want to live that way ever again. And when you're sick and tired, you're sick and tired and you don't have to keep digging if you don't want to. Awesome. Thank you, Harvey. That's, uh, it's been a very helpful um, speaker meeting. I'm grateful for you for sticking around and answering a few questions. Um, One of the things I want to address here is if we didn't get to your question or if you have other questions that you didn't want to put in in this uh, 
situation where it was recorded and will be in a podcast form, um, you can go to uh, rico12.com forward slash forum and join in our community and, and ask those questions and answer others' questions there that may come up. And you can do it, you know, first name only. It's an, uh, anonymity and, and confidentiality, just like any other rooms. Now, if you have not yet gone to rico12.com and submitted your email address, you only need to do it once. Please get on the invitation list so that you can join us live each Friday at noon central time. Next week, we have an awesome and very entertaining guest. Uh, who will talk about uh, the differences or the similarities of of addictions. We'll send out the invitation to next week's uh, speaker meeting sometime in the middle of next week, and we look forward to it. Now, to close up, if you would like to join me now in the third step prayer to launch us off on t- into the rest of the day, please do so now. God, I offer myself to Thee to build with me, and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self, that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. Keep coming back, guys. It works if you work it, so work it. You're worth it. Thanks again, Harvey. This was awesome. Thank you for having me. And happy anniversary again. Thank you. Thank you. Five years. Tremendous. Life of mine